before we get started, just a few housekeeping items uh, I wanted to cover with everyone. Um, as we go through this, we want to make this as, as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, and in order to accommodate everyone's questions, as you have questions uh, during it, please either use the Q&A feature that should be at the bottom of your screen or use the chat feature. Either one of those, uh, both Emma and I will be, uh, uh, will be monitoring uh, and, uh, and we will, uh, depending upon the question, we'll either answer the question uh, at the end of the event, we may a answer the question after the event, you know, following the event, or we may interrupt uh, Ash or Jude, uh, depending upon the question, we may interrupt them and say, hey, we've got a question we think that you uh, might wanna uh, answer at, at, at this time. So uh, that's how we'll hand handle the questions, but uh, feel free to use chat feature uh, to give us your comments uh, through this session. Uh, uh, any any questions, uh, et cetera, please, please do so. Uh, as you know, in our invite to this event, uh, we are gonna follow this with a pretty cool mixology event. Uh, we're gonna show you uh, how to mix up some, uh, some uh, holiday libations, um, and that will occur on December 10th. Uh, I'll be posting that link uh, in the chat towards the end of our session here. So be on the lookout. Uh, be on the lookout for it because uh, I'll need each of you to register. Uh, basically, what will happen is you'll register. We'll get the registration, and we will be sending out. Uh, we'll be placing the order tomorrow. So we will need that registration done. Uh, you have to plug in your, uh, you know, your address where you would want your your mixology uh, kits sent to you. Uh, so we would be prepared to. Um, you know, conduct that mixology event. I would invite you though, not when you get the kits, don't open them until uh, December 10th, so we can, um, so you can be surprised at, as to what's inside. So that's uh, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, I don't think we have any questions yet. I will continue. So I wanna give you a little bit of uh, background about Flagship Solutions Group. So Flagship Solutions Group is an IBM business partner, and uh, we just had our 12th birthday. Uh, we started back in 2008, which is a very challenging time of the economy, if you remember. Uh, but we have survived and we have grown uh, and we have uh, increased our services. Uh, and, you know, one of the latest in the last couple of years is we've really focused on security. Uh, we are a True Blue IBM business partner. Uh, we sell IBM products. Uh, and we wrap our services around those products uh, in the marketplace. So um, if you come to us, think of us as an extension of the IBM team. Uh, we do have a big portfolio of, of services around those products. From a services perspective though, uh, we do manage other infrastructures as well, uh, just uh, because uh, one, IBM asks us to a lot of times, uh, and two, our clients uh, need us to be a multi-cloud services provider. Uh, what we do not do, though, is, uh, is sell uh, products that uh, may otherwise be competitive to IBM. So you wouldn't come to us uh, for uh, if you're looking at competitive products because we are. We really focus uh, our, uh, our uh, skills and uh, we really invest our time in in IBM, so uh, we want to bring we want to bring the best of IBM to you here, and that's what we do. Part of our methodology uh, when we start working with all of our clients, we follow this four-step process for the most part. Uh, it's assess. Uh, we we start uh, talking to you and start having uh, discussions with you about what your needs are, what your gaps are, what your pain points are what you need to have happen. We'll follow that with recommendations. Uh, and then of course we do, we go to work after that. Uh, once we agree to what we're gonna work on, uh, we install and then uh, one of our key services is the ongoing support. Uh, nine out of 10 of our uh, uh, clients, uh, when they purchase uh, products from us, uh, we end up or I always call it earning the right with you. 
uh, to do some ongoing support. And that may be subscription-based services, that might be, uh, uh, you know, kind of buy the drink kind of services, uh, depending upon what you need. In fact, the next chart uh, kind of depicts that on the right-hand side. Uh, we will do everything with, uh, from help you with certain tasks in your infrastructure, all the way to completely take it off your hands uh, and, uh, you know, run, uh, run your infrastructure for you. We do that on, with several clients, uh, or we may even get into running the processes or applications for you, to, depending upon what that is. Um, uh, our goal is to minimize your IT complexity, uh, therefore reducing your operational cost uh, and creating, uh, you know, predictable support costs for you uh, and, and, and then, you know, reduce uh, some of your risks in your infrastructure. These are some of our, this is an eye chart. I'm not going to go through these, but these are some of the things that we do. Cloud monitoring, um, uh, uh, inventory monitoring, contract management. Uh, you can see patch management, mobile device management, SIM security. Um, we pretty much do uh, many, many things around your infrastructure. Uh, so think of us as, as an infrastructure managed uh, uh, company, services company. Security solutions. Um, here's what we're hearing for a lot of our, our clients, and I'm going to let Ash and Jude get into more of these, but um, uh, with the solutions. But um, you know, these are these are some of the things that might look familiar to you um, when it comes to security. Uh, you may have lack of expertise and resources to uh, to handle the never-ending job of of security, constantly changing. The threats are constantly changing, uh, you know, with the COVID challenges that we have faced in 2020, people uh, uh, working remotely and out of the office, many of our clients uh, weren't used to that and didn't have the processes for that. And that brought a whole new, uh, that brought a whole new security challenges out there. Um, you know, lots of events out there, uh, not enough time to handle those events. So these are some of the places that we might, along with IBM's products, uh, might be able to help you in, in, in your endeavors there. Uh, we'd love to pave the way to a, a more of a security program. And you can see here that we, uh, we get involved in many, many aspects of security, application security, uh, fraud prevention, identity and access endpoints, uh, mobile device management, uh, data security, all of these are, are things that, uh, that we're, um, we're uh, pretty good at. And if we're not good at it, we have a big company that stands behind us called IBM uh, with all of the resources that we need to uh, bring these uh, solutions to you. Um, we look at this holistically, or we try to, uh, but it is really depending upon your needs. But this is a, a, a pretty cool diagram that just kind of brings a lot of the aspects of security together and uh, brings it under one umbrella uh, and uh, allows for, um, you know, a complete end-to-end -end security approach. Um, a lot of our clients will bring us in on just one of the subjects and that's fine. We'll talk, you know, we'll talk one area. You may have other solutions in place for other areas, or you may be just starting out and uh, ask us to help, uh, help help you along this this uh, this path to security. So um, that's that security risk assessment. Uh, this is one thing that I'm going to just offer right out the uh, front. You may hear this throughout the uh, throughout the session, uh, but uh, following this, if if you can walk away with one thing, and that is. Uh, well, gosh, you know, flagship will help me with a uh, security risk assessment, uh, and we'll do this. You can request a, 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 a an assessment. I'll be I'll be getting this presentation out to you following this session. You can see there's some hot links in here where you can uh, request an assessment directly from us, and we'll go to work and get you on the phone or come visit or however you want to handle that. Uh, we will uh, we will do that, and and you can also see a an example report uh, of what what would uh, what, a, what would an assessment uh, look like. Uh, 
so what's next? You know, you download a, uh, you can download this, uh, um, the sample report and then request a, 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 an assessment. Okay, with that, I'm gonna pause just for a minute. Uh, Emma, I don't know if there's any questions out there uh, right now. I don't think I see any. Um, so with that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing and Ash, I am going to turn it over to you to take us through uh, the rest of the presentation. Uh, go off a of mute there, Ash. Thank you, Tom, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ash Fahe, and I lead the technical team in support of our partners at IBM. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate our partnership with uh, Tom and Flagship has been a long lasting relationship and we, we uh, certainly uh, appreciate our partnership. So um, just to uh, brief you on what we'll talk about today, what we wanted to do is get a, give a practical insight on one particular cybersecurity threat and challenge that is uh, uh, front and center today, which is ransomware. So what we want to do is give you practical insights and then share with you our view as uh, IBM, the largest enterprise security company in the world, and we support clients worldwide. Um, and so we've shared our insights. We gonna, I'm going to share with you some of our insights with our clients, as well as give you some practical insights. That's really the intent of what I will share with you today. And then we will share some of the uh, capabilities that would help you address ransomware uh, threats. So without uh, further ado, um, what I will start is just a little background on, uh, on breaches in general today. And uh, you can see that the average cost of a breach today is 3.92 and I underscore uh, that that's an average because I will show you through the charts uh, how some breaches cost a whole lot more than that. So, uh, and ransomware really stands front and center. As you will see that there's about a ransomware attack every 14 seconds today. And if you look at the, uh, the if you browse ransomware on the, on the net, um, a couple of companies that were hit uh, in the last few days, um, a, com a cloud company called Manage.com and a, a, a company that freezes products and goods called AmeriCold, AmeriCold and their systems were devastated. What I want to underscore to you is all the information that I will share now is no insider information on the companies in reference. Uh, this was all uh, from the public domain. So I'm not sharing any confidential information about the companies public domain information. One of the most uh, significant ransomware attacks uh, back a couple of years ago was FedEx and they had to pay sadly $300 million to uh, undo the ransomware uh, uh, block that was on their systems. Uh, City of Baltimore, they paid $76,000 in Bitcoin, uh, but the cost to the city was about eight or nine million. Now, what I want to say here is that the ransomware they paid was $76,000, uh, but it cost the, the city uh, seven or eight million because they've, I, I, I believe there, there's been quantified every minute uh, that your system is down, it costs about $4,500 if, you know, to a certain large, to a certain size company. So, Think of the impact, and I will discuss that. The impact of ransomware is not just the ransom you pay, but um, some of the uh, more significant ways in which uh, ransomware can affect you is either by phishing campaigns, uh, remote desktop, or obviously the uh, software vulnerabilities on your systems as a way to, to break through your defenses and get into your environment. Um, when, uh, when you look at the FBI site and their guidance, they, they actually recommend not to pay ransomware. They believe that that's behavior that um, encourages the, uh, the bad actors to do more of that. I will share with you um, that um, I was running the uh, systems for the state of Georgia, running the security 
for the state of Georgia back uh, several years ago. And on my first month on the job, um, I did have a ransomware attack. Um, and it was uh, pretty uh, um, uh, <clears throat> impactful, but for to our luck, we, uh, we actually had good backups and uh, we were able to restore from backup. And I think we lost one day of productivity. But um, I, I consider that we were very lucky that day. Um, other companies and the way that the techniques of ransom companies, uh, that ransom companies use today, and I'll show you some of those. They're very sophisticated, they're very professional, and they go to uh, extreme uh, limits to evade systems and uh, get very precise information about how they attack. Um, so speaking about the impact uh, of a ransomware, just for, for, you know, as a base understanding, the, it hits you in many facets. So the first, obviously, is that your systems will be locked down. So your, your, the systems that are used to operate your business would be unfunction, not functional because they're basically encrypted. You can't reach them. You can't use those systems. That is one aspect. What, of course, is another aspect is the cost, uh, the cost to the business at the time that you're unable to conduct business. And then there's consequences if you, if you are a company in the public domain or if you have financial information. So um, if you are a financial institution, large or small, there are regulations that require you to report. So it's very disruptive, not only to your operations, your finances, as well as uh, your legal, uh, legal posture. Um, I, I want to give you an example of an attack that was recently thwarted, and that was at Tesla, uh, the electric car company. And a particular Russian hacker group uh, reached out and contacted a, um, a, a system, uh, an employee of the IT department at Tesla, and they offered them a million dollars, a million dollars, if they would help the Russian hacker group install or let their ransomware software onto the Tesla environment, a million dollars. So if that will give you just an insight as to how far a, uh, a hacker group will go to invest a million dollars um, to, to bribe an employee of a company, uh, how much are they gonna ask? 100 million, 200 million, half a billion, a billion? A company like Tesla, the rich, would they pay a billion dollars? Who knows? But now that doesn't mean that uh, if they go after big companies, this ransomware can affect an individual user, uh, you know, us, and they could lock our personal computers and you'd have to pay $500 or a thousand bucks. So, you know, no one is safe from ransomware. Now, in the case of uh, Tesla, the employee uh, was, and, and uh, the, there's a, they went in a lot of back and forth. They came and met him in person. They gave him a phone uh, to communicate with once he, uh, he in, implants the software. But that employee uh, of Tesla was smart enough. He realized he wasn't going to get away with it. And he actually reported to uh, Tesla um, uh, IT. In turn, they contacted the FBI. And these guys uh, were in the Igor Igorovich and uh, and company. They were charged uh, by the FBI. So good for Tesla uh, that their employee was smart enough not to do anything, um, uh, you know, to to play along with those hackers. Now, why is ransomware on the rise like this, and um, why is it one of the more um, high threats to us is because, um, you know, when, when companies uh, in, in deploy their ransomware to our environment, they don't really have to steal our data. They don't have to take it out of our environment. So by simply getting to, the, to our uh, crown jewels, our key information, which is what we all protect, right? Once they get to it, they deploy their software to encrypt uh, they make it impossible to decrypt, 
and uh, and also makes it very very difficult to restore uh, by um, by encrypting your backup. So then, if if you your recent backups, you may have to go back a month or two to restore uh, because the recent backups have been backed up with the decrypted data. So they go as far as limiting your ability to restore. But the other uh, risk that is a toss up for, for us as users, as businesses, is that you, once a hacker or a hacker group is, like I said, they're organized crime and they're very sophisticated, um, that they, some, uh, some, com some ransomware companies, uh, com they are companies, by the way, um, not only will they, will they encrypt your data, they will also steal it. They will take it out. So it's optional to them, unfortunately, whether they just encrypt or encrypt and steal. So they're affecting your confidentiality. They're also affecting by taking away what was not supposed to be in their hands. They're affecting your uh, uh, availability because the data is not there to use for your normal course of business. And also your uh, um, your availability, your confidentiality, your integrity of the data. Because if they give it back to you, there's no telling what they messed with it. So um, uh, ransomware does not mean that they've only encrypted your data and won the ransom. They could also, when they steal the data, by the way, um, they sometimes l look at the behavior of the victim business or enterprise. I mean, it could be a state, it could be a hospital, it could be anyone. Small companies actually are favored because they can get 25, 50,000, 100,000 from them or else they're ruined. So no one is immune from ransomware. And the, the bigger concern that I would have is it, it, did this ransomware company only uh, encrypt, my, encrypt my data or did they also steal it? And, and what happens sometimes when they see that the, the, the victim uh, in, in environment is not responsive, what they start doing is they've stolen the data. And sometimes they will, sometimes they don't. But if they've stolen the data, they sometimes leak some of it out as a hint to the uh, companies that are impacted or governments, hospitals, whatever that, hey, we have a lot of your data and we are gonna leak it and we're gonna make it a PR disaster for you so as a pressure technique. Um, so what I wanna do is, uh, is I picked on a, on, a, on a high profile breach that happened uh, sometime in July and walk you through what happened here just to show you some of the, uh, the impact of, um, uh, to this company, Garmin. Maybe you all know it if you were a runner and you have one of those Garmin uh, watches that help you with your job. Or um, if you uh, have a navigation, a Garmin navigation system, but Garmin is more than that. Garmin is worldwide and they do uh, aeronautical navigation. So a lot of plane, plane, uh, air, 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 uh, airplane uh, navigation is through Garmin as well as uh, uh, na naval uh, navigation is done through Garmin as well. So uh, they have a lot of personal information of their joggers. In fact, where they've been with their watch, if they track uh, with the navigation system where you are. But what happened on this uh, July 23rd is the users, whether they be on, in, the, in the three areas, the personal users and the aeronautical and the naval, navigation, they were unable to use the Garmin systems. And on the left-hand side, you can see the speculators on the web, right? This is what you can see is like there's an outage. They were a little bit uh, uh, tight-lipped on what happened. Obviously, I can understand running uh, you know, an, an operations uh, security operations center. I, I, first thing for me is my systems are not working and I need to understand why. So I'm not quick to release information. And you can see on the right-hand side what the Garmin website was saying, that they, they have some, uh, some problems. But, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the World Wide Web will, will be quick to, um, to let the world know that Garmin is out of commission for some reason. Now, if you went to the Garmin Twitter account, these are some of the messages you get. 
So not a whole lot uh, of help on being able to use your systems, their systems. Um, again, this is uh, more um, more about what they, you know, what the their uh, site said. What happened with Garmin is that the hacker company, which I will speak about in a minute, and they were very detailed in how they executed. They literally paralyzed all the operational systems. So they didn't just block one of the systems. They they lasted enough uh, in the environment and encrypt and applying their software. They use um, you know those hackers. They use softwares um, like, uh, for example, Cobalt Strike, which is used by ethical hackers when they come in. Uh, Cobalt Strike is something if you if uh, if uh, if if you have an, an ethical hacker or if you uh, work with um, with Tom and get uh, a ethical hack uh, to just see how things are in your environment. Um, Cobalt Strike is used by ethical hackers to investigate. It's a legitimate tool that is used by ethical hackers to learn what the environment looks like, learn what the vulnerabilities are. It's a very sophisticated tool. And, and so when they've discovered all the key systems at Garmin, then phase two, they, they apply the software and then they push the button to log it down. And Garmin literally was on its knees. They were not able to function. So um, a little bit on the ransomwares uh, on the left hand side of the screen, um, because of our background in IBM, in supporting clients and a lot of clients reach us when they um, are uh, in trouble. Um, I'm sure also our partner uh, uh, flagship and, and Tom's team would do the same for you uh, if you're in trouble. So, but we see about 30% of our ransomware from the first uh, Saudi Nokidi uh, ransomware. But these are the top five uh, ransomwares as of recent. Um, and um, the, the way that these uh, ransomwares infect are, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, phishing or spear phishing. And phishing is just a, casting a wide net of emails and whatnot. Spear phishing is when they do social engineering, look for a particular person and uh, they they send them specific targeted emails uh, to uh, to appear legitimate from legitimate sources like their their bank uh, or their school or their boss. Uh, and um, in fact, um, one of the things that I've experienced uh, back back in the days um, in Georgia Tech and in the cybersecurity program, we actually sent emails to our uh, professor and uh, we. We pretended to be the president of the university, inviting him to a party, and we had some links at the bottom for him to click what event, uh, what scheduled event he can, can join. And it was very, very misleading, and, and uh, it was a project, and they, the, a client, the, uh, our professor fell for it, and we, we, we ran some this machine. But uh, spear phishing versus phishing, uh, two different ways, and then remote desktop, that's you know, literally trying to take over using the remote desktop protocol to take over your laptop, your desktop, um, or by sending you infected files, and then obviously um, t taking your credentials with one of these ways to to use them to to compromise you. Now, the uh, wasted locker was the ransomware that was used in the case of Garmin. And Wasted Locker uh, works by um, tricking a user to download their files by, you know, they, they send you something that they know that a particular user uses uh, uh, fi uh, fire, uh, Firefox and then it will, um, it, will, uh, it will say you need an upgrade and then once you click on that, uh, okay to download the upgrade, they have you. Because once they, once they download the software, then they have um, all the capabilities, things like they could have something like Cobalt Strike 
and other software to invest, use your desktop, your laptop, or whoever they may be that clicks on that uh, link. And they report, they, they do reconnaissance on your network, find out where your crown jewels are, because that's what they're after. They're after your crown jewels. If they've got your crown jewels, you know, wh wh where does that leave us? They report all that information back to their command and control. So it's not an automated exercise. So once they download stuff on your machine and then they can do analysis, they communicate up with their command and control and accordingly, they will then send additional uh, um, software, malicious software that would ultimately encrypt your data. Also maybe steal the data before they encrypt it. Um, <clears throat> so, what is the company? Uh, it's literally a company, Evil Corp. Evil Corp is the is the company that uh, that orchestr orchestrated the uh, attack on um, on or, um, on or, uh, on Garmin. And I want to say that this is a very highly sophisticated group of hackers. Uh, the owners are on the right, and these owners were indicted in December of last year. December 2019, they were, they were indicted. And what they did, or what they often do, is they will um, change. So their biggest uh, adversary, obviously, is your endpoint protection. And our endpoint protections, I'll get to that in a minute, but uh, they, they, will, they will go to great lengths to evade uh, your uh, your endpoint protection that they will change the version of because they are the software engineers of their ransomware software and so they are able to change their signatures in ways that your endpoint uh, protection software will not know newer version if some if some signatures hit the endpoint it will recognize it from the files they update every day but if it's a brand new copy that your endpoint doesn't know about it then, you know, they're in. So Igor and Maxim are obviously out there still. They haven't been arrested. They're in the Russian Federation, wanted by the FBI. And then in July, they struck again. Uh, in December, at the time when they were indicted, they had $400 million worth of ransom, uh, ransom money uh, collected. On July 27th, uh, back, to, back to Garmin, on July 27th, they admitted that they, this is their website. So again, this is all public from the public domain. Uh, them saying that they had a ransomware, what they paid, what, uh, what Garmin paid was $10 million to, to uh, release themselves. But what I will, what I will um, you know, uh, stress to you is that no one is immune, and so no one can say, you know, I'm too small for them to worry about. So I will tell you to each, uh, to, each, uh, 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 to each prey, there's a predator at their size. And so they may find a smaller business, and they're very happy with $25,000 uh, Christmas bonus if they collect 25000 or 30000 or 50000 uh, no money is, is, is bad money if they can get it. And typically they get it from bitcoins and things like that that they can't trace back if, if you're unable and you decide to pay, which obviously we, we don't really recommend. We wouldn't want you in that position in the first place. Prevention is the best way uh, to go rather than treatment as, as the popular wisdom. So I want to just give you, a, take a step back and look at the different layers of protection that take you through. What, what is, this is a defense in depth uh, look. And uh, obviously uh, uh, your endpoint protection is your frontline protection. And so um, that is not an area that I wanna address with you. I mean, your endpoint protection softwares that you have today, hopefully have an uh, antivirus, anti-malware protection at your endpoints. Uh, but that's not where I will take you uh, we will discuss uh, the middle tiers of your protection as well as the last line of protection. And your last line of protection is how do I protect my data? And then as we progress, my colleague um, 
a Jude who will speak later in the conversation will talk to you about some operational uh, protection capabilities. But I am focusing right here at the data protection and the application protection layers. Your last line of defense, uh, if all fails, right? But uh, hopefully you have those layers of protection ahead of you. So uh, as we discussed, the first thing and the most challenging thing is to know where the data is. I was talking with a CISO for a company uh, out in Las Vegas last week, and his biggest challenge was he, uh, he reported into the chief compliance officer of the enterprise. He was not part of IT. And his biggest challenge, he said, Ash, some of, some of uh, the database admins, they go out and they take a copy of the database. I don't know what they're doing. And you know, that's the term, if you hear the term shadow IT, uh, is if you, if you have uh, uh, you know, uh, users in the environment that are uh, tech you know, adv advanced enough, but not wise enough to know that what they're doing is really jeopardizing the whole enterprise. So if, if someone takes a copy of your data, you may be protecting your, your, your crown jewel that you know, but if a copy of it is made by an employee for ease of use or whatever the reason may be, that could be a risk for you. Or if you have multiple databases that hold your data and you don't, uh, you don't know all of them, it could be a challenge, it could be disruptive to your business. So, but the first step you want to do, that's a, so that's like a process flow. Uh, what I'm going to take you through now is a process flow of what you would, what I would recommend as a best practice to protect yourself from data. So once you've identified the data, you need to understand what are your protection mechanisms for that uh, data. Do you have the right uh, capabilities to protect it? Uh, is it encrypted, for example, yes or no? Um, then um, you want to see, is this data sufficiently secure? If you have an Oracle database, or a SQL database, Microsoft SQL, or whatever the database may be, it, does it have the right level of security uh, to protect you? Um, then you need to see who has access to your data. Is it the database admin? Is it the, the, the VP of uh, marketing? Is it your CEO? Um, uh, who? What is the level of access to level of access granted? To your, to your various types of users. Uh, once you understand that, you wanna, you wanna apply some policy because if you look at the access, you may realize that some access is justified, some access is not justified. You wanna apply some rules. Um, um, you wanna design some rules and then apply them actually. And then you wanna make sure that uh, once you apply those rules, you're able to, to prevent a certain user uh, from doing certain things. Um, if I can give you an example, uh, what is a database admin doing making a copy of all the uh, list of uh, bank accounts of the clients of the business and, and moving it to his desktop? Is that something a database admin would do? Uh, they deal with the database, but certain things are red flags. So you wanna make sure that they're not doing it. You wanna make sure that they're using the appropriate applications allowed for them to do that. Um, then you want to make sure that once you block, you want to keep all that information about who did what when, so that that will allow you some level of analysis on um, um, who did what when and, and whether certain users uh, in a particular uh, area would um, have a, a certain pattern of action. I want to tell you that uh, in my last role, and this is my second go round with IBM. My last role with I, uh, with uh, before I joined IBM, I was heading a security a security organization for a bank and, or financial uh, enterprise. And one of the senior brokers turned in his notice. And uh, what he was doing through his notice, he was because we had disabled the USBs on the desktops and the laptops, but he was printing pages and pages and pages and pages of uh, client data. And he was flagged through our user behavior analytics capabilities that he was doing something that was uh, outside of the norm of his normal job. So monitoring and making sure you're reporting because then you can catch the anomalies. 
And obviously, you want to make sure that you comply with regulatory, regulatory regulations, which is a benign requirement, but it could get us into a lot of hot water. Make sure that if you're in the financial space or if you're using credit cards, if you uh, have personal protected information, health information, that you comply with the regulation in that space. So with that being said, I want to just briefly uh, walk you through the Guardian product because the Guardian IBM uh, product is a specialized a suite of tools that is uh, designed to, to do uh, just what I explained to you, all these steps, so it, it puts everything in a, in a, I won't say it's a touch once and go, it's really a journey uh, of those steps that I explained to you. So as we explained, the first thing you want to do is discover, and, and what Guardian will do is with, it will sit on the network and monitor all the protocol activity. It will tell you what databases you have, uh, it will encrypt it for you if it's not encrypted, and um, it will also uh, do additional uh, capabilities, which, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but also for every database, and there is a national repository uh, of, of vulnerabilities on databases like uh, SQL Server databases, Oracle databases, and, and uh, you, you always have uh, the, the vulnerabilities that come on a regular basis for your databases. A lot of us will focus on the OS portion, but you just as well need to know if your databases are vulnerable. Some of that may not be visible to a scanner tool, uh, but because of, our, uh, of the control and the capability that Guardian has on a steady basis, it would tell you what vulnerabilities your systems have. It will also tell you who has entitled, entitlement to your data and allows you to set the rules that we just talked about to protect your databases, your files uh, in the cloud um, and monitor that behavior. And if a user acts in a way that is outside of what's defined for them, it can block them. And then finally, we have capabilities like the dynamic masking. So if you need to hide a portion of the, uh, of a social security, a bank account, that is also a capability that's in the Guardian Protect. And then um, obviously the, the monitoring of, uh, of data, the Guardian piece, if you have a large database that, that you, you really wanna, because encryption is just the first step, um, you're able to uh, do that uh, with live encryption. You don't have to take your database down to encrypt it. And that's just a basic step However, um, I will tell you some caveats on data encryption. But anyway, more than that, you're able to gather a lot of data insights, and uh, once you have that data, you can report it in ways that are usable for management to assess the good work that's being done and where there are risks in ways that are consumable for a business leader, or a vice president of operations, or a CEO of the company that tells you where your data resides and the uh, the impact of the uh, of the data risk, and then you can send it to your other technologies if, if available. What I want to talk to you is a couple of use cases real quick about once you encrypt your data. If a user has the encryption keys, they can get to the data. But what we are able to define with Guardian is what we call a, uh, a um, guard point. And what's a guard point? A guard point will allow you to define um, a file, um, a database, and define what users have access to the data, um, exactly whether it's direct or through an application. And then, if the user uh, attempts to access the files in a way that is not specifically defined, and there's a, a ton of uh, out-of-the-box rules that allow you to grant specific access to the user, whether directly to the file or through something like Excel or whatever the application may be, if they try and do something that they're not predefined to access from the data, even if it's a sysadmin or a database admin, they will be blocked and they will be reported. One last thing is 
sometimes applications and, uh, and, and ransomware, they, if they learn that you access a database through, um, um, through a particular application, it can spoof the application. So what Guardian will do, it actually has a hash for the list of applications that are uh, available to access the data. So if the hash doesn't match, it will recognize that this is a spoofed application. These two cases, um, I, I am unable to bring you the demo here, but with these two use cases here, we, we, we run a, a demo where we, we identify a, a list of applications or databases, and then we run a simulator, uh, simulated ransomware software, and the first time around, it encrypts uh, the, rans the data and you're in a ransomware situation. We then run it again with the protection from Guardian and um, the, ransom the ransomware software doesn't even see that directly because if you have specified a particular user and specifics around how they access the directory, the file, the folder, um, if the ransomware software is just trying to search to encrypt, it's not visible to them. If they try to spoof the application, it's, it's, not, it's caught and identified. So we have, we have uh, uh, demo capabilities that show how we could do this. Uh, time doesn't allow this today, but this is a great way that, to protect yourself against ransomware in a way that takes you through the journey of identifying all the way to managing and reporting. And then finally, uh, this is what I'm going to leave you with before I hand it off to uh, Jude, is, you know, these are your steps that you, steps that you have to repeat and rinse, discover, encrypt, protect, monitor, manage, and report. And never forget the reporting because, you know, all your good work needs to be seen by management, leadership. Otherwise, there's no appreciation for the risk. Otherwise, when it's doom day, they come to you and say, how come? Why? Why did this happen? Make sure you report. And these are things that you should be able to do fairly easily uh, with Guardian. And I will leave you with one last thought. It is not an expensive technology. I mean, it is, it is not cheap, but depending on the size of the business, this could be very affordable. So with that, uh, I will pass it to my colleague, Jude, uh, esteemed colleague, and Jude, have at it. Thank you, Ash. Can you uh, unshare your screen so I can? Ah, of course. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, and just a quick reminder, uh, use your chat, uh, use your Q&A if you have any uh, questions. Okay, thanks everyone. So I'm Jude Lancaster. I work with Ash uh, and on our, um, we call our client profession, technical professional team that uh, covers our business partners. And what I'm going to talk about today is, um, uh, is, is bringing uh, all of this together, the things that uh, Ash talked about and um, what, uh, what uh, uh, we can do from a perspective of bringing these things all together uh, within a, a seamless, um, and okay, there we go, that's what I wanted, with a seamless experience with some of our other security tools. And I'm gonna talk specifically about our SIM tool, which is QRadar. Uh, so QRadar fits in the wheel that, um, that Ash talked about earlier in the threat intelligence space. And it is um, really the, the linchpin of IBM security strategy because it's where all of these technologies come together and fit into one spot. And let, let's talk a little bit about QRadar and, and why we think it's important as, as a technology uh, for, our, for our clients. So really what we see is that we have plenty of data but we don't have enough insight into that data. And that's really where QRadar can help us. So what, what we find when we talk to clients is that of the alerts that they receive, about 44% of them are not investigated. And 54% uh, uh, of uh, um, the uh, uh, alerts that are legitimate are, have not been remediated. And uh, when we talk to CISOs, we find that about 36% of them say that keeping up with those alerts is a top concern. So we have plenty of data, but we're not doing the right things with the data. And so that's where uh, QRadar can really help us. Hey, Jude, uh, just one moment. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, 
you you're not sharing your screen uh your oh. charts so just okay. i think uh we're just seeing your pretty face and uh not the not the charts well i don't know that anyone would ever accuse me of being pretty but let's, uh, <laughs> let's see if we can share i thought i was sharing i apologize you know it, it really um lessens your credibility when you um when you you know you have a technical person that can't even uh you can't even uh, share a, share a uh <laughs> share a screen correctly okay so let me see let me get back into zoom here it's not cooperating there we go huh interesting it says i'm sharing I can share for you, Jude. No, 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 I got it. How's that? Can you see it now? Okay. Yep, we're all set. Thanks. Okay, great. Yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. So what I talked about on this slide is the amount of data that we have and that we're not, we don't have um, uh, the correct insights into that data, unfortunately, um, based on the statistics that I, that, I, that I mentioned. And so what we um, find with, with Curator is we, we try to help customers get a better sense of what is going on with that data. And we think that there are really four, four um, pillars to, a, to an effective SIM platform, of course, Curator being the IBM SIM platform, and that's visibility. So making sure you can see everything that is on your network and out there. And then when you do get threats uh, as part of your uh, environment, making sure you prioritize those. Because what we find is that most environments and most customers don't have enough um, uh, resources, unfortunately. You know, there's a, there's a large skill gap and there's also a large shortage in skilled uh, personnel that can help us in the cybersecurity space. And, and so to, uh, to help with that is uh, the third pillar is to automate those investigations. And then when, once those investigations have been, um, uh, have been started, to integrate the response to the threats that we see. And, and um, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, we have all this data coming in from our endpoints, you know, our network. Uh, we have data activity that can be pulled in through Guardium, and then those all funnel into, into Q-Radar, uh, and, and we categorize those threats and those risks from insider threats to external threats, and uh, more and more we're seeing risks in the cloud space as, as more of our customers move their workloads to the cloud, um, existing vulnerabilities, and then making sure we protect our critical data. And so that's where we think uh, Q-Radar can come in, and here's how we fit in with the, those pillars that I mentioned. So um, QRadar can give you complete visibility into your environment. So we can, we can take all the data from all of your different log sources and normalize that data into uh, true insight into what you're seeing as opposed to just raw logs um, from your network, your endpoint, and uh, more and more so the cloud and your users and your applications. And then we'll prioritize the threats that are detected through the sources that we're bringing in, leveraging the MITRE attack framework, leveraging AI and um, behavior chaining, and pulling in global threat intelligence feeds from X-Force and other sources. Um, and then automating those investigation using artificial intelligence, le leveraging our, our AI engine Watson, um, mining that data for for uh, for information that is that is relevant to your SOC analysts, and then providing um, even unstructured data analysis through our X Force threat intelligence feed as well, and then integrating the response. You know, Ash talked about uh, being able to do things with Guardian Guardian data encryption. That's just one of the ways that we bring all of these products together is through the integrations with all of our security tools like Guardium, like QRadar, and like our SOAR tool, um, Resilient, and then also CloudPack for security, which is our, our full integration into all of the IBM security technologies. And so just a, just a few more details around QRadar, and then we'll talk about how QRadar can actually help um, uh, bringing in that Guardium data uh, encryption information and then help with ransomware as well. So uh, this is a, a screenshot of, of, of the QRadar interface where we can um, uh, bring in all our offenses into one area. 
um, and, and give you integrated visibility and investigative capabilities in a single screen. And then um, leveraging our, our, as I mentioned before, our artificial intelligence, Watson, to help your staff triage and uh, provide investigative capabilities into the threats that are uh, identified by QRadar from the log sources that we bring in. And what we're trying to really give you is complete visibility into the entire environment, whether it be uh, on-prem endpoints or on-prem network uh, events uh, or the cloud workflows and work for, and work um, workloads that you're leveraging. So you may leverage uh, AWS, you may leverage uh, Azure or the IBM Cloud. All of those uh, information about those workloads can be brought into QRadar so you can secure your entire environment. And you can see those threats as they move from AWS into your own internal environment. And that's really one of the things that we try to highlight um, with, with QRadar. Now where it gets really powerful is when you add uh, IBM tools together like Guardian Data Encryption and QRadar. So this shows one of the charts that we can do when we bring in information from Guardian Data Encryption, which can be done just by a normal syslog as you would with any, um, any, any SIM source. And these, these are some dashboard widgets that show um, user statistics around uh, who's, who's accessing what databases, what applications are, are uh, um, accessing the GDE guard points, and then some user statistics around uh, events that are occurring within Guardian to show denied events and if those are possible security risks. Um, and then we can also show uh, file actions uh, observed based on all of the Guardian data encryption. So it shows how these uh, technologies can be brought together to provide you a holistic view of what's going on in the environment. And, and it's not just uh, Curator and Guardian, really all of IBM security tools are, are designed to work together to give you that um, that uh, holistic view of what's going on in the environment and, and frankly protect your environment better and make your uh, SOC analysts more effective in doing things. So what we try to do with QRadar is uh, really solve your, in, uh, your security challenges, things like de detecting advanced threats, and you know we focused on ransomware today. One of the other things we do is it very effectively is is uh, detect ransomware before it can spread throughout the network. And I'll show you that in a moment on the next slides. Um, and then respond to those threats as we see them come into the environment through the log sources uh, that are provided. And one of the most powerful capabilities of of the IBM security um, suite of products is our is our app exchange. So what we have are uh, apps from both our uh, both designed by IBM as well as our partners that will um, uh, enhance the information that you get within within uh, IBM security products like Guardium, like um, uh, Q Radar. So these are developed both by IBM as well as our partners. The majority of them are free and will will add to uh, what you're getting from from the app from the uh, IBM suite of tools. Um, to date, there are more than 250 QRadar applications, and there are several, uh, several dozen Guardian applications as well to help uh, better protect your environment for things that are relevant to you. So just a couple of uh, ways that we do do ransomware detection. One of, the, one of the slickest parts of QRadar is our ability to bring in what we call threat intelligence insights. So we can bring in threat feeds that are... Um, in the sticks taxi format. And these, these can be from any source. It doesn't have to be from IBM, but we do include IBM's threat intelligence feeds uh, with QRadar. And they help you um, not only see what new ransomware campaigns are out there and are active, but also if you're affected. So you, there's actually a button within the uh, threat intelligence application to check to see if that those uh, indicators are anywhere in your environment based on the log sources that you're bringing in. And then our, our user behavior analytics will also uh, help determine if uh, a, a, an endpoint in your environment was, um, uh, was, was affected by ransomware. And if so, you can take action to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to alleviate that, that uh, attack. 
And then we also include some content extensions that are part of our app exchange. So this is the uh, QRadar content extension, which brings in uh, all of these different capabilities. And, and uh, a couple of those capabilities are just general ransomware behavior, as well as looking for specific ransomwares. Um, you know, the, the one of the one of the uh, ransomware campaigns that. Uh, uh, Ash mentioned earlier was the, and I, I never can say this right, the Soda Noki, no, Nokimi ransomware. And that was what we were seeing was about 30% of ransomware activity that's out there. And so we provide capabilities uh, in order for you to identify these and other campaigns that are active. And we continue to update these as we see um, research into these. Uh, the um, the uh, BitLocker campaign was was uh, pretty uh, uh, was pretty active, and we're seeing a lot of attacks on healthcare organizations, especially in the ransomware space with with COVID. So these are all things that we monitor actively and make sure that um, that uh, uh, that we are providing capability to our customers in order to detect and alleviate those kind of campaigns. So that's really what Ash and I wanted to talk about today. We're gonna to open it up for questions and answers. So please feel free to, um, to uh, uh, ask any questions that, that you might have and we'll be happy to answer them. Any questions out there? Well, why, uh, while we're waiting on that, uh, I am going to uh, post in the chat uh, the link uh, for the Mixology event. Uh, uh, again, as I said at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the call, um, uh, please go to this link and uh, uh, go ahead and register. It'll take you to like a landing page, uh, registration page, and uh, uh, just click on that link. Uh, you put the address in which you want your Mixology kit uh, to be sent. Uh, we will get those sent out. Uh, they will begin going out um, uh, next, uh, uh, next, next week. Uh, and, um, and then we will, we will see you at that, at, at that event. Uh, you should be getting it here in just a minute. You'll see a hot link there. Please click on that. And we'll pause for a few minutes uh, to see if there's any other uh, Q and A's. Uh, Ash, Jude, uh, we appreciate uh, your time. Emma, I know you're out there too and have been helping us. Uh, we appreciate the IBMers uh, that have taken uh, their time to uh, come and present uh, uh, th these valuable tools to us. <laughs> Uh, as, as you look at these tools and consider the tools, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself. We'll be sending a follow-up email uh, with access to the DECA charts. Uh, so you'll have that, and then you'll have my contact information, and uh, we, will, um, we will get with you based on your specific needs and uh, have conversations and see how we can support you and help you in, in your security endeavors. Uh, did if anybody did not get the link, uh, let me know. Uh, if you you know just send a chat and say I didn't I didn't get the link or whatever. But uh, or you can even raise your hand. There's a little raise your hand item there. You could raise your hand. Okay, I'm assuming everybody's on the uh, the web page there and, and and doing that. We'll intercept those and and go from there. Again, Ash, uh, Jude, Emma. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Thank you everybody else uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, and with that, we will end the call. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.